So adamantbeliever.com forward slash worship dot P D F. Speaking of David, Psalms 115 and 1 is where we're going to start. When you have it, say amen. I just always want to say that, D. I don't get to say that. Psalms 115 and 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is their God now? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he what? But our God is in the heavens, and he hath done whatever he pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but what? They can't even see. Y'all know some people like that? Well, we're talking about the idols. We're not talking about people, but amen. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but what? They hear not. Noses have they, but what? They smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. Idols don't speak. False gods don't speak. They that make, this is the key right here. They that make them are like unto them. So the person that goes after these gods are like them. So is everyone that what? Trusted them. You go after false gods, you have eyes, but you can't see. <laughs> yeah, when you go after false gods, you have mouths, but you can't really speak. You know folks that talk but don't say nothing? I was watching a video clip of, uh, what's the dude? Terrence Howard, is that his name? The actor? From the, what's the movie? Uh, Hustle and Flow? <laughs> don't act like you ain't seen that. <laughs> Don't you do that. Don't do me like that. Don't, don't do me like that. I'm not, I'm not going to put up with that. We will turn the lights back on. Terrence Howard, somebody, your soul food. That's the one you saw. Amen. So Terrence Howard, was he in soul food? But y'all know me, like, I don't like black movies. I'm real racist when it comes to my movie selection. I don't, if it's too many black people, I'm not watching. Now that's just me. I gotta see the cast, the supporting cast before I even decide. <laughs> my life's too precious for two hours of foolishness. I'm not watching Soul Plane. Not watching Friday. I'm not getting cussed out. I'm not getting molested by the TV. My eyes, I just, I have to guard myself. Amen. And if it's too many of us in it, it's going to be some debauchery. The debauchery level increases. Amen. I know we have some Caucasians in here. Just let me say it. You don't have to say it. I'll say it. But, <laughs> but <laughs> Terrence Howard, I'm watching Terrence Howard, and my brain started hurting. Have y'all heard him talk lately? He was breaking down the science of nothing. He said some things that were so deep that I don't know what he was talking about. <laughs> He's into this new thing that's nothing. 
and I don't know what he's talking about. And my head was just hurting. And I was like, this guy has talked and people interviewing him and they're like, oh, really, really? And he ain't said nothing. And it reminded me of what these idols are, like nothing. See, here's why people are so mad at truth. Because truth makes sense. Okay? I love, I love the power of the Holy Ghost. I love the miracles. I love the blessings. I love all the wonderful, great, supernatural things our God is capable of. Is he capable of supernatural things? He's capable, more than capable. I mean, we have the right God. Don't get me wrong. But if you subtract all of those things, you're still going to be left with logic. Like, what is logical? You can never take the logic from the logos. You can never separate the logos from the logic. It's all, it just, look, somebody say, God just makes sense. It just makes sense. It makes sense. If I sit up here and watch these explicit videos and this nasty hip-hop music, it's going to change my behavior, make me start desiring it, then I'm going to go out and act on it. That just makes sense. That's why the word, the logos, says shun the very up." appearance of evil logic it just makes sense let's see if i stay in fornication and adultery i'm gonna have a child outside of marriage and i'm not gonna be able to give my full time to this child so this child's gonna grow up in a deficit the bible says thou shalt not commit adultery it's basic it just look somebody say it just makes sense god just makes sense If I use drugs, I'm going to start doing stuff based on how the drugs are affecting me. It's going to change my behavior. I'm going to make some serious mistakes. And those mistakes are not only going to hurt me, they're going to hurt the people around me and the ones I'm responsible for. The Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's logic. Amen? Amen? So that's why people that don't want truth or people that want to do things their own way, they hate God. So they have to build a statue and convince themselves that this idol is talking to them and telling them what they should do. Because the real God is going to stop what you want to do with logic. Amen. And so... People now, they, 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 you know, Terrence Howard and all these guys, they're into all of these old weird things where they're growing their hair out weird and they're changing their appearance and just talking some foolish words and people getting into it. Now it's all about this sensual, false God stuff that people are into. Now this earthy, third eye stuff. Yeah, especially African Americans. Especially African American women. Be, just being online friends with a digital witch just having a hashtag sent to you can be witchcraft the devil invented the internet not God the devil now you can use it for some positive things but it can also be used to forward his agenda. And he'll have you earthy and weird, believing some foolishness, masquerading as massage and reinke and all of these different things that these witches are going and getting licensed for so they can lay hands over you and pray over you and put spirits into you. Why, you just trying to enjoy a massage. <laughs> you walk in the room and look on the wall, there's a picture of Buddha. Look on the other wall, there's some hands with an eye on it. Look on the other wall, and then it, there's an elephant. Some walls, there's Shiva. And you going to lay on that table? That's a prayer service. I don't want to digress too much because I have a whole lot of that. 
But, yeah, that's, yeah, false God worship. And the devil knows how to maximize it. And he, he, man. And so we're not aware of it, but we don't understand that these false gods, people choose these false gods because the true and living God has logic that doesn't agree with their ambitions. You ever known somebody that just don't want to be saved because they know it's going to conflict with what they want to do? That's everybody that's not saved. Can I keep going? Amen. We become what we worship. Look at somebody and say, you become what you worship. If we worship other gods, we become spiritually deaf, dumb, blind, and fashioned after the hands of man. If you become what you worship and you worship other gods, you become those gods. The statue is just a symbol of what you're going to become. The spirit needs a real body. So the spirit needs you to submit to the statue so it can be an entity living within you. You think, you think that demon wants to live in a statue? He can't move. Can't talk. He can't go anywhere. But if he's in you, he can not only hurt you, but he can hurt other people too. Idolatry makes us like false gods. Obedience is worship. Look at somebody and say, obedience is worship. Not singing a song, not laying prostrate, not crying out to God. No, obedience. Yeah. Obedience. It's just a bunch of noise to God if there's no obedience behind it. Amen. It's not singing songs and trying to create an atmosphere with great sounding music or lyrics. You know, folks love to create that atmosphere. We're going to create an atmosphere and we're going to welcome his presence in. So I need everyone to just focus so we can welcome his presence in. Well, what did you do before you got there? And what are you planning to do when you leave? That's going to tell me what the, what's going to be in the atmosphere. Now, you can hire a fog machine and them little mist machines they have at Six Flags to skeet water on everybody. And you can call that the glory cloud all you want. But God is looking at what you're going to do, what you did before, and what you're going to do after. That's going to be the atmosphere. You know, folks walk in here with the wrong atmosphere. You seen those cartoons where there's a thundercloud following somebody just striking lightning and just, you just you look behind you and folk just laid out. You done struck folks with lightning because you brought the wrong atmosphere with you. True worship unto God is more than singing. Look at somebody and say, obedience is worship. Man, my sons, I get, you know, we just gathered around up here, and man, nobody, anybody that knows me knows how much I love these boys. Landon, John, they just, I love these boys, and they know it. But the way they show me love and honor me is obedience. If they're just wilding out and doing whatever, hey, your, your son, too, if they're just wilding out and doing whatever they want to do, if they tell me they love me, I'm going to be like, Really? Can I preach in here? Yeah. So it's not singing songs trying to create an atmosphere with great sound and musical lyrics. This is what Lucifer did. So if that's worship, then Lucifer was the greatest worshiper because he was able to make music and lead folks into the atmosphere. Lucifer was able to do that. Then once he got everybody into the atmosphere, he led, the Bible said, a third of them out of the presence of God. This is what Lucifer did. He made beautiful music. You think his music wasn't good? Look at somebody. Yeah, it's good now, too. <laughs> that earth, wind, and fire, big boy. <laughs> Devil can make some music, Jack. Lucifer made beautiful music. 
The Bible said it didn't even stop there. He was beautifully adorned. He was a beautifully adorned being. But he was disobedient and had what? He had iniquity in him. Ezekiel 24, 14 and 15. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Some people interpret that as the planets. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created till what? Iniquity was found in thee. So you can have all the talent in the world, but it's not worship to God what you're doing until you obey. Amen? Abraham was obedient to God. He wants to offer his only son, the one he waited 100 years for. Now, can you imagine that? God is telling you, you're going to have a child. Sarah's laughing. I'm 100. Was she 100? She was close. I can't have a child. I, they can't have. She laughed. The Bible says she laughed in the tent. And then when they, uh, was it an angel, rebuked her and said, don't be laughing. And she got scared. And, no, I wasn't laughing. <laughs> yeah. A hundred years. Just a hundred years. And finally get this son. I mean, they even tried to help the Lord. Now, you bless the Lord. But you don't help the Look at somebody say, bless him, but don't help him. You don't help the Lord. Okay, so <laughs> you let God do his thing. Don't you go in there trying to help him out. Abraham made that mistake, and they still fighting over there. It's going to take the end time world ending treaty to stop that fight. Ishmael's seed and Isaac's seed, but they tried to help the Lord. Ishmael came and I was like, nope, that's not the one either. You're going to have one yourself, not with a handmaiden. So they finally get this son, and then God tells him, okay, now you have the son of promise. So I'm going to promise, I'm promising this you're, 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 is going to multiply your seed. It's going to be like the stars, all of these things. Now go kill him. Go sacrifice him. And Abraham had a choice to make. And let me tell you something, y'all. Abraham made... Not only did he make a faith choice, an obedient choice, he made the logical choice. You want to know why it's logical? Because the God that gave him to me definitely knows what he's doing with him. <laughs> See, some folks, <laughs> God bless you with something, and then you start wilding out and going away from the God that blessed you with it. No, you need the God to help you manage it. Because that's the same God that gave it to you. No, is that not logical? Is it logical, Elder? That's logic, simple logic. And Abraham just like, you know, I just, I, why would I hesitate if I didn't have one until he said I would? Why would I hesitate? Because it's, the, look, somebody says it's the same God. I'm going to look somebody to say today a lot to get ready for that. Yeah, it's the same God. So if it's the same God, then I'm just going to do what he says. So he was to offer his only son because God asked him to. That's the only reason. God asked him to, and he wanted to be obedient, and so he did it. The Bible said he packed up everything. Let's go. We're going to the mountain. We're going where God told us to go, and we're going to sacrifice. I'm going to sacrifice my son. He wasn't a little bitty boy either. Okay, so he, 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 was, he was up there a little bit. And he's like, let's go, you know. He was, he was able to walk and carry stuff. We're going to go up here. The, the Bible even said he called that act worship. So his son and the, the guys around him didn't think he was going up there to sing. <laughs> no. Genesis 22 and 5 says, And Abraham said to his servants, Settle down and stay here with the donkey. And I and the young man, Young man will go up yonder and worship and come again to you. And some people like to say, oh, well, you know, Abraham knew that God wasn't going to do it and go through it. No, he didn't. He just knew that God is able to bring him back. If he gave him to me 
in the first place. So, he called this act of obedience worship. We cannot worship God without obeying him. Talking about some sound and brass and tinkling cymbals. God don't want to hear you singing and disobeying. And we cannot truly repent without obeying him. You ever had somebody in your, somebody in your life to keep doing you wrong and keep saying, I'm sorry? And then do you wrong again and say, I'm sorry? And then do you wrong again? Wait! Your sorry doesn't mean anything anymore because you're not even obeying your own repentance. So we cannot truly repent without obeying him. That means if we're going to truly repent, we're going to change something. 1 Peter 1 and 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to what? The former lust in your ignorance. You're not going to do the same dumb stuff. After you repent, you're going to be obedient. We need to bring whoopings back. You know, when I was young, that's what we got. Whoopings. Whoopings. COVID beatings. I need a COVID whooping. I'm sick of you! <laughs> All day, every day. What you? COVID, somebody need a whooping. We need to bring that back. Amen. Bring that back. Do what I say. If you're going to eat my food, you're going to do what I say. Amen. My parents would just grab stuff. Amen. My mama, she little, she looked little. Oh, but she carries a big stick. When I was young, it was just, I mean, she would get me. My dad, they would just get me. A lot of times I deserved, I was telling the brothers the other day, my dad, sometimes he just thought something was wrong with me. He would literally be perplexed. He did what? How did you think? Of I was telling him, you know, we were playing a little um, electronic football game yesterday. And me and the Marshall, we were playing this, this game where they, you know, the men vibrate on this board. This old school, little men. And, you know, we couldn't really get nowhere on it because I bought the cheap one. Men kept falling over. It just didn't work. We got to send that back. Amen. But, but back in the day, my parents had got me the real one, the Tudor one. It was a uh, metal and it was big. And so you put these men on it, plug it in the wall, turn it on, and they move, you know. So my dad used to carry the film to burning hell. I've told y'all that before. He used to show the burning hell all the time. So, you know, I had the bright idea. And, you know, my younger sister, Andrew, Tanya wasn't really into the stuff I thought of. You know, she, <laughs> she kind of stayed away because she knew it was going to end in, 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 in some kind of punishment. But Andrew was too young to really make those decisions. She wasn't as decisive because she was still young. Man, I needed an audience. So we got the game, and we, I'm watching the burning hell, so I'm like, man, let's just make these football men be in hell. So with the game still plugged in the wall, I got some alcohol and poured it all over the board with the men on there, and I turned it on so they would be moving. I didn't want them to be burning steel. So I turned it on with the alcohol, lit a match, threw it on there. And the whole thing just lit up. Whoop. And you know, Andre is looking like, like this, this has escalated pretty quickly. Like this is beyond what I have bargained. And we watched the men and they would just be, you know, then they just start melting. I was like, man, this is so cool. I had heard that once the alcohol burned, the fire going to stop. That's what I had heard. Like if I hadn't heard that, I wouldn't have even done this. And so, <laughs> and so the fire wouldn't go out. So I started throwing stuff over it or whatever. Anyway, they put the fire out. And, you know, 
that was the, this is the downside of my sidekick. <laughs> she would tell it. That's the only thing. I was like, Raj, on what's happening? Like, why would you do that in front of her knowing she going to tell it? But I needed an audience. It wasn't fun to do that by myself. So my daddy got home. Mother, I don't know if you even, well, you knew about this. Did you remember this? And my daddy got home, and he was like, what? And he burned it, and he put liquid on it and lit it a fire, and a fire in the house, in the bed. He go in the bedroom and look. And in his mind, you know, I could tell when things don't make sense. He started blaming himself. What did I do to you? Like, what? What did I do? How did this happen? Why would you sit here? And he would just, ah, oh, dude, he would just grab something. Ah, oh, just start beating. <laughs> he would grab anything in the vicinity, just whatever was near. And I understand now that you have to do that because I was crazy. That was, cr I could have burnt. That's crazy. Something was wrong. I needed that. Man, it made sense in my head, though. He shouldn't have made me watch the burning hell. That was his fault. <laughs> but we cannot worship without <laughs> obeying him. And, you know, we cannot truly repent without obeying. 1 Peter 1 and 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the form of lust in your ignorance. We must not get caught up in a cycle of sinning, repenting, and what? Returning to sin. You know, I don't understand this yet fully, but I do believe that the area of grace that we lived in prior to 2020 is changing. And when I say I don't understand, I'm going to have to get a little more information. Trust me, I'll have it. But it's just like when I'm praying and talking to the Lord and reading, I'm, I'm, it's almost like when I read the children of Israel, I watch how they had this much grace to begin with. And then by the time the end of the Chronicle Kings happened, the Chronicles of the King, they had this much. And it was like God's tolerance began to shrink. And it's weird because people really say this. Yeah, but that's because Jesus hadn't died. And there was really no mercy now that he's died. No. There was no mercy. If there was no mercy, there'd be no Old Testament. Watch this. Watch, watch these trickle claps. Yeah, somebody just... That wasn't mercy? That wasn't mercy? These folks going after, going whoring after false gods and God still letting them live? These kings wilding out. That wasn't mercy. Abraham with his handmaiden. That wasn't mercy. Cain with Abel. That wasn't mercy. Did Cain keep living? That wasn't mercy. The Old Testament really shows you the mercy of God. God is just merciful no matter what dispensation he's in. Jesus came to pay the penalty for sin. But mercy has always been there. If his mercy endures forever, that means it's forwards and backwards. That means it's all, that's who he is. <laughs> it's mercy. But... The Bible says he's long-suffering. But now it seems like that window of grace is shrinking because the times are getting so wicked and the tolerance of it is changing. So we can't, especially, look somebody say, especially in this hour. In this hour, get caught up in a cycle of sinning, repenting, and returning to sin, Hebrews 6 and 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto what? Perfection, acting better. Acting. Do you know the way you act is your choice? Man, when people come up to me, can you pray for me, Pastor? I think I got a demon. Okay, 
Usually when people say that, they don't have one. Now, if you come up to me and growl those words out, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. It's either a demon or you Louis Armstrong. But it, it <laughs> but yeah, I okay. I, I might I, I might think that something is wrong now. But just coming up to me, I think I got a demon. I, why do you think that? Because I just can't do right. Well, Paul said he can't do right. He said every time he tried to do the right thing, wrong comes into his mind. The only difference in you and him is you're acting on the wrong that's coming into your mind. But wrong comes into all of our minds. Does wrong come in your mind? Look at somebody. No, not mine. You don't understand. I am saved and sanctimonious since the age of tender age of eight when I was filled with the Holy Ghost. Spoke in tongues and floated up into the ceiling. And I just don't, I don't, I don't just watch nothing. I don't listen to nothing. I just don't do any of those things that the Gentiles do. <laughs> No, man. Bad thoughts. Does bad thoughts come in everybody's head? That's what Paul meant. He meant, man, I, the, the good I want to do, it's hard for me to do because bad thoughts keep coming in my head. Paul said that. So don't come to me telling me you got a demon just because you're acting on the bad thoughts. I'm going to tell you, stop doing it. Stop acting on the bad thoughts. Because if it's not your choice anymore, then we need to commit you. <laughs> See, somebody don't want to. Yeah, if, if, if you can't choose anymore, then something is severely wrong mentally. You have to be able to face up to the fact that it is your choice. Amen? So leaving the principles of the doctrine, let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. We must walk in obedience and true worship with our lifestyle, not just our words. So quit singing it if you're not going to live it. Quit singing it if you're not going to do it. Don't come in here and oh, just just falling out and eyes just oh just bucking and shouting and you're going to go and live the same way. That's why those folks when we was young they would tie the church up they jump and reach and pull these lights down to try to prove something new has happened to them. Because we know as soon as, as, soon as they leave the church it's back to the old them. Now you got to do another trick. It's got to be it's got to be more spectacular. Now you got to swing on this thing. Every week, <laughs> you got to improve. <laughs> Every week, it's a new feat. <laughs> because you won't live right. Y'all didn't grow up like I did in church, but that would, that would really happen. You know, the dude that just couldn't do right. He was just no good from the floor up. He could not do right. So when he came in to prove that the move of God took this time, he would tear half the seats. He'd tear the wood off the pew. Kicking and biting and screaming to show you that this time, and then they'd hand him the mic afterwards. Deshaun, am I telling the truth? They hand him the mic. Why do you got to hand him the mic? They hand him the mic. This time, y'all, it's for real this time. And everybody just going crazy. Then the little baby come up. I gave my life to the Lord. Well, that's good, Junior. Now get on over there. Because Deacon John, this is the real story. This is the headline right here. <laughs> this is going to make the folks go up. Y'all didn't grow up like I did. <laughs> that's the one they want to hear. But we must walk in obedience and true worship with our lifestyle and not just our words. Matthew 15 and 8. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips. But what? Their heart is far from me. Anyone can start worshiping because of a need. This is a sign of an immature believer. 
The only time you get before the Lord is when you need something or in trouble. You're in trouble. That's an that's a immature believer. You might not be saved. You need to check it. If the only time you talk to God is when you need to talk to God. But we should mature to the place where we worship out of what? Desire. Don't you desire to worship him? Don't you desire to be in his presence? Desire to talk to him? You lay in the bed in the morning when you wake up and you can't wait to talk to him? Luke 6 and 46. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? When we can worship God before the battle, don't wait till the battle is over. <laughs> we just talked about that in the office. Some of these songs, amen. Yeah, don't wait till the battle is over. You shout now. Shout before the battle. When we can worship God before the battle, we can avoid a lot of unnecessary battles. You worship him before the battle, the battle might not happen. Our obedience will cause us to avoid a lot of calamity and consequences just by being obedient. Exodus 23 and 22, but if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thy adversary. So when you got God as an enemy of your enemies and an adversary of your adversaries, you can't lose. Look at somebody and say, I can't lose with the stuff I use. Somebody say, no, nah, I'm not saying that. That's, that. I'm not saying that. But you can't lose if he's going to be an enemy to your enemies. Amen? This is why it's so important to worship through obedience at all times. Being obedient at all times. Don't wait till trouble comes to start trying to do right. We bless the Lord with our obedience and we praise him verbally. That's how you bless the Lord, with your obedience. We can't give him gifts. We can't give him money. We can't buy him presents. You bless him with your obedience to who he created you to be. That blesses him. It always blesses a manufacturer when what he has produced functions accordingly. If he made it to work this way and it works perfectly that way, he's blessed. It blesses him. We bless the Lord with our obedience and praise him verbally. Psalms 34 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. It's impossible for you to worship and sing. I mean, it's impossible for you to sing and praise and worship all at all times. That's impossible. So what does he mean, I will bless the Lord at all times? How can you constantly, at all times, do praise and worship? You can't. He's talking about a lifestyle. That's what you can do at all times. You can bless him with your life at all times, the way you live. Amen. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That means whenever it's time. His praise is there. But his praise isn't there if you're not always obedient to him. Amen. You know, have you, have you ever gone on a spell where you wasn't acting right? It's hard to get in his presence. I mean, if you for real. You're serving the true and living God. You know, people create the, their own God or their own idea of God. You know, every culture that has fallen is because they misunderstood God. It's a misunderstanding. That's what's wrong with America. It's falling because there's a misunderstanding of who God is. You don't approach God the way you approach him if you understand how he is. So that's what I'm talking about. So you got to have a good understanding of who God is. Amen? And once you understand that, 
you know that his praise can continually be in your mouth in every situation there is a praise. Amen? This combination fortifies us and keeps us strengthened in him. Even when tested. Look at somebody say, even when tested. If we walk in obedience during the test, we know that it is just a test. Now, this next part is about to bless somebody. 1 Peter 4 and 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. It's God's will, and he's allowing the fiery trial. But if you walk in obedience during the test, you know the test is a test. And it's just a test. In other words, let me clarify. Consequences of disobedience will cause us to view our testing as punishment instead of a trial. So you walk in disobedience and stuff is happening. Now you think God is punishing you. Now you're confused and you don't know what's a test and what's your mess. Galatians 6 and 7, be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever man soweth. That shall he also reap. So if you wild and wildness is going to, it's going to visit you. The consequences. And some of them, you, you're not going to be able to call that a test. That's the mess. There's a difference. Can I keep preaching in here? When we are disobedient, we are at fault and feel we're reaping. God forgives and restores, but we still suffer for what? Disobeying him. It's going to cost you to disobey him. And you can't call that a test. Ooh, these fiery trials. No, quit acting a donkey. That's your actions coming back. You keep doing stuff. Romans 6 and 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So sin, look at somebody say, sin just costs. There's a price. However, listen to this, but when we are obedient and tests and trials come, we have an, either great, an even greater assurance that it is only a test because we aren't guilty. So when you walk in obedience, things are still going to happen. Walking in obedience unto God, doing things the right way, and life happens. But this is why it's important for us to worship, which is obedience. Because when life decides to happen, we take it before God with clean hands. Amen. God, this is out of my control. Why did this happen? What? What is going on? It's just a test. It's just a trial. It's life. Amen? 1 Peter 3 and 14. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. This is the posture Jesus had. Although he faced a terrible ordeal during his crucifixion, he was able to endure it knowing he was not guilty. It made a difference, knowing that he was being obedient unto death. So when you live a life of obedience, when you get before God, you can get before God not guilty. Now, of course, we're guilty of some things, but I'm saying as far as what led to the trial that you're going through, it doesn't have to be because you did something dumb. And it wreaked havoc on your life. It could just be life. Amen? And when you're able to separate the two, you don't have to feel the guilt of it. You know, that's what's happening with a lot of believers today. They, they can't, they, they, they're depressed and, you know, have anxiety and all of these different things because 
they are victims of their own decisions constantly. Those aren't trials and tribulations. Those aren't tests. Those are your actions and those are consequences. You have to change your actions so that you can go through things with a clear conscience. Oh, the amens are thin and out, man. This is, is too holiness for you. This message is too holiness for you. It's Romans 8 and 17. And all of us should be trying to live and strive for perfection. Amen. We're not carrying Jesus as a car, a get out of jail free card. This is not just about not going to hell. This is about loving him to obedience, which is worship. Amen. My wife loved me broke no matter what state I'm in. And I've been in all the states. Her love has not changed. So don't just love me for money. That wouldn't feel too good, would it? You don't want to just love God because he's going to keep you out of hell. That means you're really afraid of the devil. <laughs> yeah. No, you want to love God and be with God because he's right. That's the right way. I want his way. I want to know his ways and be like him. Let me hurry up because somebody, this is too holiness for them. He was able to endure it. Not knowing he was, I mean, I mean, knowing that he was not guilty. Romans 8 and 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also what? So if you suffer with him and go through these things that life just brings, we're going to get to be glorified with him. Amen. I'm, anybody looking forward to that? 1 Peter 3 and 17, for it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. What do you mean suffer for well-doing? Suffer with Christ. Just go through things. Trusting God. He's going to allow certain things so we will trust him. Amen? True worship keeps us strengthened during the tests and trials because we are partaking of Christ's suffering and sharing in it with him. Matthew 5 and 11 says, blessed are ye when men shall revile you. Anybody ever been reviled? And Anybody ever been persecuted? And shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He said, blessed are ye because that's what happened to the prophets. When we are forgiven and walking in obedience, we know that the testing of our faith is only helping us and after it is over, what's going to happen? We will be better than before. James says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh what? Patience. But let patience have our perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire. There are things in us that only tests and trials can work out of us. Only tests and trials are going to work it out of you. One, because you won't seek God and find out what it is. Or you don't spend the time with God to know what it is. So a test or a trial will have to come. It doesn't always mean we are walking in disobedience. It could be that it, we acquired it back when we were in sin. So it could be something that's lingering over in your behavior that you need to deal with. Amen? Luke 22 and 31. The Lord says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may what? Test you. Because I just saw something in you when you lifted yourself up in front of the others and thought you were better than them. I need to get that out of you. You didn't learn that from me. That happened before you got with me. God knows and will, all, and will allow us to go through tests to remove it. And when we are restored, we are what? 
stronger than before. Anybody stronger than they were five years ago? When we live a life of worship, we overcome the temptations of those tests and pass them. You know, when you pass certain tests, they don't test you anymore. Because you passed it. If you went to a school where you had to keep taking the same test over and over and over, you'd get sick of that, wouldn't you? But if you pass it, you don't have to take it again. Because you passed it. Well, there are certain things in your life God allows to happen. Once you pass it, you're not tested there anymore. Because it's not a test for you. It's not a temptation if you overcame it. Man, I wish somebody was listening. <laughs> when we live a life of worship, we overcome the temptations of those tests and pass them. Luke 22 and 32. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, do what? Strengthen your brother. So the Lord had to know this was a test because he's telling them what's going to happen even after the test. So this ain't going to destroy you, Simon. This is just testing you, Simon. And the greatest intercessor of all times is Jesus Christ. So if Jesus is praying for you, look at somebody and say, I need Jesus to pray for me. If Jesus, can you imagine what his prayer sounds like? That's going to be one of the first things I want to know when I get up there. Lord, pray. I just want to hear you. And knowing the Lord, he's going to say, you already read what I said. Our Father, which art in heaven. I was like, nah. Come on, Lord. <laughs> I know you can go in. Now. <laughs> we think so crazy sometimes. Anybody think like that? Like, man, what? Just could you imagine the prayer meeting? The greatest intercessor. Oh, my goodness. I'm getting chills just thinking about it. And who's on the organ? You good, PJ, but I don't know if you're ready for the heavenly pipes. <laughs> Amen. Summary! The church has caused us to believe that worship is about music and singing. That's the first thing you think of when you hear worship. But in the Bible, and the devil did that, by the way. The, the devil wanted to make music synonymous with worship instead of obedience. Because that's what he did when he was up there. Making music in disobedience. Oh, that'll preach, won't it? In the Bible, worship unto God was about doing what he commanded. True worship is adoration to the point of obedience. This is... Obedience is an act of trust and commitment to God. Because we become what we worship, the more we worship God through obedience, this is so logical. The more we worship God through obedience, not singing, but obedience, the more we become like him. Just like the statues and the idols. You become what you worship. So if I, we're obedient to God, walking like him, acting like him, we're becoming more like him. This is true worship. Because he is spirit, when we worship him in spirit and truth, we gain more of him in us, and that makes us more like him and less of who we once were. This is why we must fashion ourselves after him and truly live a life of obedience unto him so that we will Glorify him in our bodies and represent him in the earth. John 4 and 23, but the hour cometh and now is. Look at somebody say, now is the hour. The hour cometh that now is. When the true worshipers, not the recording artists, not the praise team, not the soloists sending up requests for themselves, not the online singers, not all of the YouTube worship leaders, but the true worshipers shall worship the Father, not with music, but how? In spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such.
to worship him. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him. How? In spirit. And how? In truth. Everyone stand to your feet. Many of us, we just need God to ignite that in us so that worship becomes more than music. Worship becomes how we walk, how we live. We should pray to be overtaken completely by the power of the Holy Ghost so that our actions reflect him. Amen? Do you want to be like him? Do you really want to be like him? Everyone bow your heads. And come on, just lift your hands up if you can. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this word. We thank you, Lord, for this truth. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit. For us to truly worship you, we must live a life that is pleasing unto you. We can't displease you and bless you. God, we can't do our own thing and make you happy. Can't make you smile while we're in sin. God, help us, Father, to understand that true worship is obedience. I pray right now, Father, that we would come to the knowledge of this so that our lives will glorify you every minute of the day. Father, I pray that the things that we used to could get away with, that you would arrest our hearts and convict us. I pray for conviction right now. Anything that is displeasing with you. Father, no matter how much we like it or are in love with it, we will let it go if it's displeasing to you because we want to live a life of worship unto you. I pray right now, Father, that your people in this last hour will understand that it's not about the singing. It's not about the congregational singing. It's not just about the music. But, Father God, it is about obedience. I pray that we will obey you. Let all of our ways be obedient unto you. Areas we don't even know about, give them to us right now. As we're standing with our hands up, speak to us. Speak to our hearts through your spirit. Tell us those areas. Tell us what we need to change. Tell us what we need to do. And we'll do it, Father God so that we can be perfectly aligned with a lifestyle that is worshipful and pleasing so that you will be blessed by us. We give you glory and honor for it, Lord. Changes will be made. No matter how hard it is, changes will be made so that our lives can be lives of worship. We give you glory and honor, Lord, and thank you for this message. Thank you for truth and holiness. Thank you for uprightness and righteousness. Thank you for the mark being high and we being low. And us, we, we just have to step it up for your sake. We have to strive to be better for your sake. We have to strive to live better for your sake. We can't get comfortable in our flesh. But ignite that in us, Lord, so that we can be beings of worship and bless you at all times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.